The thoughts and opinions on Just Some Podcast are of the hosts and guests and do not represent the views of organizations that employ them or they volunteer for. They are also not responsible for spontaneous black holes or nuclear wars that may occur. You have been been warned. Welcome, 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 everybody, to another fun-filled and exciting episode of Just Some Podcast. This is Tom. Hey, this is Ben. Tom, bud. It's been a little while since we've talked because I had a lot of severe weather in my area, so we ended up canceling last week's episode. So how's it been since I talked to you last? Well, your weather has moved this direction. You can have it. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Not nearly as bad as what you guys had. But overall, pretty good. I think it's important we let everybody know we are recording on Memorial Day. So thank you to everybody that served and has sacrificed for this country. And I think we both appreciate that. Absolutely. I'm super excited. We have a guest. We do. You want to go ahead and introduce her? Well, I think I think actually I'm going to turn it over to her and let her introduce herself. Miss Rochelle? Hi. Want to tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Yes. Hello. No, I'm Rochelle. I'm a nurse practitioner here in sunny, hot, desert dry New Mexico. (laughs) And so I work as a dermatology MP and an ER provider. And I'm happy to be here and see what y'all are talking about and see how I can get involved today. Awesome. Well, I think it's important we had a listener or someone that has is familiar with the show at least reached out to me and was like, hey, summertime, mm-hmm. skin safety and skin cancer, though, that would be a really good episode. And Ben reached out and got a hold of Miss Rochelle, who is wonderful and an expert in the dermatology field. And she graced us with her presence. She clearly, clearly doesn't listen to the show a lot, otherwise she wouldn't have lowered her standards <laughs> this far down. <laughs> <laughs> and and I was Maybe cracking I'm up. Just I was look- as low. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a whole. Apparently, Miss Rochelle, you need to come back. We need to have a uh, effects of alcohol right. episode too. We'll just see how low that can go. Oh, but <laughs> no, Ben's Ben's already putting that down. So <laughs> I did laugh though when she said desert dry, and I looked at Ben because I know his part of the country is just flood stage. Oh, no. So he's yeah, wishing. <laughs> Yeah. We could use some of that dryness because we were building arcs up here. It's crazy. <laughs> it's, yeah. Like every night it's raining more. Like oh, we God. most of our rivers are well above flood stage. We're looking at record flooding right now. So yeah, it's wow. crazy. Yeah. I've lived through a flood. I lived in northern Illinois on the Mississippi. And yeah. It's one of those things and I don't know if you've lived anywhere, in Mr. Shell, because like you said, you're in New Mexico. I know we <laughs> talked pre production that you'd been in other places, but having seen a flood like in person it's i think it's hard for people that don't live near waterways to they're thinking oh well the water is just up no it 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 takes a toll on everything and so i think sometimes it's hard to imagine stuff like that when we don't live in the area like if you said something about the desert i'd be like well i've never into the desert, yeah, it's just go desert tumbleweed so. and stuff like that. But <laughs> no, I did live in Georgia, so I get it. And lots of floods and trees, and you can't get up hills, and it can destroys everything. So I, I get it. It's, it's very devastating for people who have to actually go through that. But I've been there. I lived in it, so I know. Well, and I, I do got to give credit to one of the local police departments with their uh, Facebook page. They made a post basically saying swimming in flood water is very similar to if you were taking a bath with everybody from Walmart. And I was like, you know, that that fits. <laughs> well, that's one of the things about floods I don't think everybody always remembers is that includes sewer systems. Yeah. Yeah, right? 
Yeah. So you, uh, if you're in a municipal area that's flooded, you may want to think about wading out into a bunch of water there for a while. Just throwing that out. Yeah. So, but anyway, we're, we're, so, we're dry currently, so we're okay. We're dry currently. So just a little more, Mr. Shell. So how long have you been working in dermatology and, and stuff like so- that? Let's just go with Rochelle. Miss makes me sound old, even <laughs> my kids. Rochelle, I'm just, cool. I'm just trying to be respectful. You are respectful, so. but Rochelle's cool. No, I've been in Durham uh, five years now, but I've worked, I've worked. It's kind of been crazy because I kind of worked a little bit simultaneously, like between that and the ER. So I'm running an office, and I'm running the ER. Then I got an online suture course, and I'm mentor student, so. I'm kind of like all over the place a little bit, but it's organized all over the place. So I'm just trying to find, I think when we get into being MPs and being providers and stuff like that, I think we get involved in so many things. I think it will come to us. You know, you don't, you start revol- uh, revolving after about five years. And so that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, no, I agree. You definitely, as a seasoned nurse practitioner, kind of get your finger into a lot of pots and trying to figure out what works best for you and, it's very much organized chaos, but it does work, so that's what we do. Yeah, we do. It's like an exhausted chair. <laughs> I was just thinking of that, like, oh my god, I'm tired. Yeah, yeah, you get exhausted, but it's but you know what, you know, then like everything I was doing today, just working on some presentations for the hospital, working on some different things, and then when I got a call from you and you talked to me about Tom and so the these type of things and just collaborating with other providers or other people in healthcare, regardless if it's a live platform or not, it kind of makes things worthwhile because you get to actually give real dialogue on what it is that you're doing and what it is that the public and the community actually needs to do. And so it's different from that Facebook platform, different from that. And so this is good. This feels good, if that makes sense. Yeah. So basically what you're saying is Ben warned you about me? Basically what I'm saying is I've lowered my standards to your level. (laughs) And I'm happy about it. I'm good. That is... That is oh it it's it was lonely down here, but now Now I'm feeling better. So (laughs) Yes, ma'am. Well, since we talked about some of that stuff, Ben loves doing the social media shout out, Mr. Shell. So let's go ahead and let people know where they can find us, Ben. Well, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all at Just Some Podcast. Or you can find us on the web. We're at www.justsomepodcast.com. You can also find us on Libsyn, which is Just Some Podcast.libsyn, L I B S Y N.com. And don't forget, you can find us on YouTube and Helium Radio. We are on Helium Radio After Dark. That's their channel too. Thursday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 Central. Email us if you want to be on the show, like Rochelle here admin at justsomepodcast.com. Tom, what else can they do, man? Well, first of all, they can give us some ratings or reviews or tell any mm-hmm. of their friends about our websites or social media, just like you let them know. If they uh, feel like they can get to my level, which is pretty low, they can go ahead and email us and come on the show. Also, they can go to our website. At the bottom, there's an Amazon affiliate link. Click on that and then do any of their Amazon shopping. It helps out the show and it costs them nothing. It's quick, it's easy, and lots of people are using it. And that is always appreciated. Miss Rochelle? Yeah. Is there anything you want to shout out or tell people about or how to find you if they want to? Well, um, most people know, you know, here in New Mexico where I'm at. (laughs) I think what I'll do is I think I'll give a shout out to the show. And I think more MPs and more people who have some good dialogue to talk about should be here and should be interviewing with you guys. So that's where I'm at with that today. Well, awesome. Just so you know. Social media wise, Ben and I, and I've I've been brainstorming. I haven't made a lot of traction yet, but we have two missions, Miss Rochelle. Mm-hmm. Mission Antarctica. We are trying to figure out how to get downloaded in Antarctica so that we can say we've been downloaded on every continent in the world because we are. I know you said New Mexico, but you're being listened to right now from Australia to China to Scotland to everywhere. Yeah. So we're we're trying to get we're trying to get that one last continent. We got to get in our. Well, that's some good news because most people that I tell I live in New Mexico think I actually live in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like no. Well, no, 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 it's still Colorado. the United States. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the second thing. 
is and this is the one ben we yeah we're trying to get downloaded on the international space station mission so, galactica yeah it, it's going to be something rochelle yeah. this could be that episode yeah. you could be downloaded on the international space station so wow oh man and speaking of mission galactica yeah. Uh, Tom, you know, we do got to give a shout out to one of our listeners, John. He did some research for us and got us some contacts with NASA. So we're going to be reaching out to them here in the next couple of weeks and see if we can get something set up. So appreciate John listening and doing some of the legwork for us. Yeah, but realistically, John has contacted us before. Mostly all he does is correct things I've said on the show. <laughs> oh. So realistically, he Someone... should just uh, he should do some more work like I. I feel like I know him a little better now, and, and honestly, he could just do some more work, John. Figure it out for us. Like, make this easy, okay? Just send me a link that I can click and talk to this guy, and then we'll, we'll make it happen. So, John, when you hear this, please let me know. Hi, this is John. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I can't wait to be like, John, you sound like a chick, bro. <laughs> Ah, I think he's going to get a kick out of this. He, he he's pretty good about feedback, so this this should be good. So stories, Ben, you said you had one. Yeah, I got a story that you may have missed, Tom. There is a new study out, and it was published in the Frontiers in Aging Neuroscience Journal, showing that there is potential brain changes occurring up to thirty four years before Alzheimer's symptoms. So they were doing some research to try to determine if we can diagnose this sooner than we can start working to help with that. And emerging research has suggested that there are some brain mechanisms that start at least 10 years before a diagnosis and then up to even 34 years prior to the diagnosis. They reviewed medical records of 290 people who were at least 40 years old and they had them do cognitive testing and that helped to show even subtle decline before they started developing symptoms. And they also found raised levels of the tau protein, which is a biomarker in Alzheimer's disease. And they detected higher levels of this protein as early as 34 years before onset of symptoms. Stating there, our study suggests it may be possible to use brain imaging and spinal fluid analysis to assess risk for Alzheimer's disease at least 10 years or more before the most common symptoms, such as mild cognitive impairment, occur. Tom, what are your thoughts, man? Well, I know... It's one of those disease processes not everyone is affected by, so sometimes it goes in the background. But having watched that in my own family, I really hope that we continue to make that progress. Yeah. It's, it's not a flashy disease. you know. There's not a lot of awareness out there, mm -hmm. not as much as there is with other disease processes. And I hope we find those markers or we find genetic components that we can just test for and saliva testing or something and that we start making some more progress with that i think that's fantastic mm -hmm. i usually i have something smart alecky to say but i'm like wow no that's <laughs> i think that's fantastic right. i i just hope that right. um when those guys right. you know get some recognition they go hey just some podcast put it out there and that's really <laughs> when we took off and they tell us and they let us they let us know because we are that important i think that'd be great yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> see there you go they got the just some podcast bump right there just listening <laughs> yeah. uh i just i hope that the work continues and that they keep showing positive results and that we find a way to identify and then hopefully kill this disease i mean it's i don't know that's the part i think is gonna be trickier i think eventually we'll be able to genetically identify it it's then okay then what do you do that, I think, is a whole new issue. Yeah, but hopefully if you have decades of advanced time to at least know that, hey, you could potentially be afflicted with this, then maybe we can start doing some other things to you know, help boost brain energy and brain power and things of that nature as opposed to just kind of blindly falling into it when we turn 60 or 70. So I could see some definite benefit to it. But then, I, you know, the flip side of that is diseases like Huntington's disease and things like that where you can do mm -hmm. genetic testing for that you also have that component of well do you want to know that you could potentially be afflicted with this down the road or not so definitely some ethical yeah. issues there also that's some good info though so Rochelle would you want to know um yeah I've been saying you know if you can get this information out there then you know you can possibly get some research or some other things for help with prevention who knows 
I mean, they were doing a lot of stuff with stem cells and all kind of things for Parkinson's disease. So That's true. before yeah. that, people just kind of lived and suffered with Parkinson's disease. I mean, 15, 20 years ago, I didn't know anything about stem cells and how they could do that. Even when people have babies, they save the cord blood now for different things. So yeah, I mean, the more research that we can get, you know, the better, especially when it's something that could possibly, hopefully be prevented. Yeah, for sure. And I think she hit on something there that is also the research, research into stem cells, research into other processes that we can use to correct these diseases and not just diseases. I mean, we're, we're starting to find stuff for like knee injuries. Yeah. Like there's all sorts of stuff. I think there's a bright future and stuff like stem cell research. I just hope we capitalize on it. I think too often, especially now, and, and I'm going to say this in general, cause I don't think it's so much our listening base, but in general, people have started to accept their scientific information in the form of memes on Facebook hmm. and when they see something that says, oh, stem cells are bad or stem cells equal mm-hmm. murder. And so they're like, oh, we shouldn't do that. And I'm like, no, no, that's not exactly the process here. And so I think sometimes scientific education and research has gone by the wayside. Mm-hmm. And I think Rochelle hit it like, hey, you know, we're doing crazy, awesome stuff with stem cells. Yeah, that might be the future. I just hope we continue down that road. And maybe they'll find out that Sudoku and playing that has something to do with it. And therefore, when I win my Nobel Prize, they'll be like, Tom's research on this is what really made (laughs) everything else possible. Ben, do you think it's possible? Uh, Do you think that's what's going to happen next? Yeah, I'm just looking forward to Jeff and I being in the front row in the bright blue and the lime green suits for you. Yeah, looking forward to that. I want to see ruffled shirts, sir, and top hats. Of course. I mean, if you're doing it, you might as well do it well. Don't half ass it. Exactly. Yeah, no, you're, we're going all the way. If we're, if we're going if we're going there and we're getting that Nobel, I'm going in a tuxedo shirt that says I'm ready to party personally. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's what I want to see. Oh, all right. Wow. Let's talk about the episode at hand. What do you think? Yeah, I'm good with that. Okay. So I think we kind of briefly went over it. So we brought on a derm specialist. So let's get into some derm. And I mean, this conversation go where it goes, but... Let's start off with Rochelle. What are some important factors or recommendations you have for people for skin and sun safety going into this hotter part of the year? Yeah, well, you know, it's getting hot. Yeah, there's so much information out here, like with skin cancer and sunscreens and what to do. I think the the most important thing is actually just taking care of yourself and taking care of your kids and taking care of your family. It is so serious. I can't tell you how many preventable skin cancers that I see. Typically, when you're talking about things like a basal cell that are particularly sun-driven or squamous cells, skin cancers, those type of things are particularly sun-driven. Most of those things are not necessarily hereditary, such as like melanoma and those type of things. But I think the most important thing is wearing sunscreen. And another important thing is getting men to actually wear it because they don't wear it. And one of the most common things I hear from men is that, well, I don't like it because it drips and it burns my eyes and it's oily and it makes me hot. They have a lot of different preparations out there now. They have some in the spray that stays on pretty well. They also have a stick and it kind of looks like a, almost like a deodorant stick. It goes on really clear. It's not really sticky. So that tends to work. You can even rub it in your hands and put it on. So they do have some things out here now that getting away from those traditional creams that you have to wear and keep applying over and over and over. I will tell you that the one thing that confuses people is the number. And so typically when we're trying to um, protect ourselves from UVB and UVA sun rays, the SPF of 30 gives you about 95% coverage. The SPF of 50 gives you about 97% coverage. So there is no 100% coverage. Why they sell SPF of 70 or 100, I don't know, maybe it's marketing. Probably. But but, but nothing is like ever 100% coverage. I was going to say, I personally, well, I would describe myself as pasty. (laughs) 
there you go like i think that's a good one yeah uh translucent perhaps that's reflective there you go that's a good one <laughs> i like see i would disagree that there is 100 percent. i stay inside in the air conditioning and don't even go outside so <laughs> but you know but you know some people, <laughs> so, do, some people do say oh well i don't go outside outside for a minute but you do have i mean there's sun when there's cloudy days right there's sun cloudy days and so you're in and out yeah, and so yeah. typically you should wear sense. don't try to sell us this an abstinence bullshit tom no <laughs> yeah right but think about it though as you get older you have these dna structural changes so your sun damage that occurred occurred 10 years before it even happened most times yeah if that makes sense no that does yeah, yeah. you're saying because i was actually going to ask that before you started talking about it mm-hmm. so spf 30 is good sps 50 is good beyond that yeah anything else i mean only thing i found is i don't know if it actually put it this way i have used an spf of 70 and i'm black but i do it because it helps with the actual burn i you know i feel that the higher spfs are more of a thicker preparation i don't know if they cause less sun damage if that kind of makes sense okay. i guess if you want to use the analogy i mean I'm trying to give you a good analogy of shower versus a bath i mean you're still submerged in water it's just how much and so i don't think it you know from the research it doesn't actually give you any more coverage but i'm saying for myself when i use it i feel like i burn less but i do burn like i, I peel and i burn and and that's another thing too, like a myth with African Americans or Hispanics or people of darker skin who believe that they can't get skin cancer or that they don't need to wear sunscreen because they don't actually burn. Well, they actually do. <laughs> and not only that, if you want to talk about vitamin D synthesis, we, you know, as a dark person, you, you think you're getting all the sun, but we have a hard time even synthesizing that. So. All of us should be wearing like sunscreen all the time, you know, as much as we can, especially during the summer months too. So I was going to ask, so you covered SPF. Great. Thank you. That was actually, I, and I think that's the, that's the gimme mm-hmm. with sun. Like everybody wants to know which SPF. Mm-hmm. And like I said, if they made a 1500, I'd grab it. Mm-hmm. But, um, my, one of the things I use, especially in my child and myself, mm-hmm. the spray is, is there a preference in the dermatology world for lotion application versus spray application, is there one that is found to be better or is it just making sure you get it on? I think the overall goal is making sure you get it on. And I know they have some waterproof out there. I mean, some brands work better than others. I don't think there's a difference. I think the creams, people don't like those. Um, They kind of ruin your clothes. They're kind of messy. They don't like to keep reapplying. I think the sprays are really nice. I don't know if you've used the spray or not. It actually goes on very cool. So it, whatever's in the can keeps it very cool. And so it goes on the skin very cool and it doesn't drip. It was almost like spraying a layer of rubber or something in that in that sense that once you spray it on, it's kind of like a coating that sticks to the skin, if that kind of makes sense. But it's not sticky. It's just like, it's like a protection kind of thing. And so if that kind of makes a little bit more sense to you when you actually spray it on. It's kind of like a coating. It reminds you of Pam. Do you know Pam that you like? Oh, yeah. Those, like those non Yeah, it reminds you of that. But, it, but you don't even know that you're actually wearing it. So it doesn't feel heavy. I can tell you from experience. Because about 10 years ago, I went on a Caribbean cruise, and I'm going to do that next week, so we're going to bump record like back-to-back episodes. But if you're using the spray, make sure that you have somebody else apply it, because I thought I'd just be smart and spray myself down, and I ended up like tiger-striped. So (laughs) where it actually actually sprayed was great, and then everything else was red. So it was white, red, white, (laughs) red. Yeah, horrible. So if you have, so, so here's the thing, like if you, if you have kids, you know, especially like babies, they shouldn't really be exposed to a lot of skin and stuff like that. So you do want to protect their eyes. And that's another thing people need to do. They need to protect their eyes. So it's not just spraying your skin and, and your eyes can be, anybody's eyes can be affected. 
whether it's blue or whether it's brown or whatever. I mean, my husband has brown eyes, but clearly he has a huge teragium in his eye from the, from, from sunlight, from staring at the sun um, quite a bit. Wow. Yeah, so you want to make sure that you're wearing a UV blocking type sunglasses and that type of thing um, when you're out. They even suggest them for kids. You know that sunburns typically cause dehydration. And so if you have a child, you want to make sure that you're giving them plenty of fluids, especially water, and you're kind of watching them. Cool baths tends to help them a lot, too, if, the, if it's really warm outside. You don't want to apply alcohol over a sunburn. You don't want to be doing that, okay? Typically, calamine lotion tends to work a little bit. You don't need to really do antihistamines and those kind of things. What about aloe vera? Aloe vera works great, but you don't want to be using like medicated cream, like hydrocortisone or benzocaine and those type of things. You don't really need to do that. Um, it might cause a little bit more skin irritation. Remember, you're treating warm skin or you're treating actual burn. So you just want to make sure that you take care of your kids. And if you have like teenagers, well, here's the thing, like most states now, they actually ban tanning booths and stuff like that, but there's still a few of them up. So you just kind of want to make sure you're watching that. The typical time people tend to get burned is somewhere between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. That's typically the hottest time. Okay. Hmm. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah right. typically the hottest time. So, you know, you just want to make sure you get some shade. Whatever you don't have on with sunscreen preparation, you can always try clothing, broad rim hats, UVB sunglasses, the whole thing. Make sure that you're examining your skin from head to toe every month as well, too. Just want to make sure you're checking things out, seeing if anything is abnormal. But that's typically it. Well, okay, I was going to ask, so what did you suggest for treating sunburns? But you went ahead and hit that up. So here's a question Mm -hmm. for me like seeing patients in the family mm-hmm. practice so when i'm looking i know how to grade burns from an er i was ben and i also have an er background when we're looking at burns sunburns i understand the blistering i understand the the basic grades but what is some of the over-the-counter suggestions or for the nurse practitioner for prescription purposes, what sort of treatments at what grades do you start suggesting things? Well, here's the thing. So, you know, everybody's skin type is different. You got that Fitzpatrick's skin from one through five. Some of it is even through six. And so the person obviously is the, is the one who's the pale, red hair, blonde. They're going to burn a lot quicker. Typically, they may burn at a higher level. Sometimes you may not see an actual burn for two to six hours to after the peak. Sometimes it may take 12 to 24 hours. In other words, they actually burn, but the skin actually doesn't start blistering until they get to that particular stage. And so you may see some erythema. Sometimes they have some swelling, tenderness, obviously irritation. The skin is going to feel very warm to touch pain, blisters, and very, very rare cases. Um, you may see chills and fevers and stuff like that. Those are signs of usually dehydration and shock and electrolyte imbalances and those kind of things. So typical treatment, if you would think about it, of course, sun exposure would be highest at between 10 to 4. Some places, there's some research that's 10 to 2. You basically want to do everything you can to kind of cool down the skin, Okay. So you're talking about moisturizers, you're talking about cool cloths, you're not talking about butter, you know, <laughs> so some people want to put butter. I've heard that. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, well, we've heard people sometimes, you know, say, it's funny you said that. I have not had a person coming in smelling like a butterball turkey yet, <laughs> but I remember there was that episode of Seinfeld and It's something I've heard before, so I was just imagining somebody walking into your office and you're like, is someone making a ham? What's going on? Why do I smell butter everywhere around here? So, Well, you'll you'll probably get more sunburns in the ER than I actually get in Durham, to be be honest with you. (laughs) People don't typically make Durham appointments for burns. They typically will go to ER or family practice, if that kind of makes sense. So here's the irony, like for children, you don't need hydrocortisone creams and stuff like that. For adults, you can apply a topical steroid cream, probably twice a day because it's anti-inflammatory. You kind of want to 
cool down that skin. They can take aspirin every four hours or so. Um, that tends to help. Other than that, you wouldn't treat it any different than what you would a regular burn. I mean, when you're talking, when you start getting into second degree burns and stuff like that, then you got to start looking at fluids and, you know, possible antibiotics and those kind of things. But typical red, irritated, peeling type skin, those are pretty much sources that you can just treat. And if I had to treat it, can't say for sure, but maybe a mild topical steroid cream may work. Um, you could even do our hydrocortisone 2.5 with aloe. Um, they have that. If you had to step up your game for whatever reason, you could even go and try and sit along maybe a um, 0.25 or 0.5 a couple times a day for about seven days. See, I was going to try and slip in that triumph sit alone because that's like one of the few things I knew about. Like, <laughs> oh, so could I do a triumph sit alone? But let's see. She's not a game. Yeah, can't do a like... I mean, if you need to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it's funny. Yeah. But remember, it's a burn. You want to cool the burning process. And so this is kind of like the opposite. Well, I don't want to say frostbite, but because we're talking about skin cancer, but you know, it's like frostbite. You do that rapid rewarming. But with sunburns, you do like a cooler, cooling off the skin. You're doing things to cool the skin. And so it doesn't make sense for them to get treated and say, oh, okay, well, I'm treated now. I feel better today. Even though I'm burned a little bit, I'm just going to go back out in the sun. No, <laughs> you have to heal the skin because once it starts peeling and it starts cracking, then now we're making the person's or now the person's more susceptible to infection, if that kind of makes sense. Because now you're dealing with an open area versus a, something that's Well, closed. one other thing I've heard besides butter would be vinegar. They said it takes the sting out. Is there any significance or why would something acidic based or is that just complete folk tale? There's no basis at all for that. There is research for vinegar baths and bleach baths, but they do not apply to sunburn. They typically apply to things like urticaria or eczema, those type of things. With the vinegar, I only saw one research article on that. It's supposed to balance, quote unquote, the pH and kind of help the skin from itching and that kind of thing. I know for sure that the Clorox mm -hmm. bleach baths tend to help with itching any bacteria that's been the goal. And same with vinegar. They say the pH helps with any bacteria that may be present or anything of that nature. But those are typical other dermatological conditions that does not apply to sunburn. I don't think that putting a burn, I don't think it will cause more burning. I just don't see the pathophysiology and how that could help. Okay. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I don't see that. But I don't know because the research, like I said, the research that I've seen on vinegar, and I can shoot you an article at some point, but the research I saw on vinegar was totally unrelated to, to summer. Well, it's just been my experience with people and vinegar. They seem to think it's like magic. Like it fixes everything. Like sunburns, check. Uh, when I lived in Hawaii, if you got stung by a jellyfish, people were like, oh, you should put uh, vinegar on it. I'm like, why? So now yeah. I can stink and my foot hurts from getting a jellyfish. Like, <laughs> don't, don't forget your toenail fungus. Like a lot of older people use apple cider vinegar. Yeah, or drink it for weight loss. Yeah. What'd you say, Ben? Said or drink it for weight loss. No. <laughs> what, no. no. They soak weird. everything in vinegar. Like you got these old wives tales. I mean, I've had, I've treated skin cancers from people and I mean, I mean, it looked pretty bad. I'm like, they said, oh, I've been putting slab on there. I'm like, what's that? Yep. I didn't even yep. know that exists. I guess it's some kind of cream. Yeah. Have you seen, oh, it was on television. I saw it on Instagram on one of the medical ones I follow. The lady who used uh, something, it's called black salve or black poultice. And it basically ate the front of her nose off, the tip of her nose. <sighs> She had a little, she had a little spot, and and I couldn't tell from the picture, and nor am I a dermatology NP, mm -hmm. but uh, she had a little spot. And I guess it was identified as a skin cancer, and she wanted to do something homeopathic instead of getting a Mohs procedure, and so she went ahead and put a little bit of the stuff on. Well, and it says use very sparingly, very light layer. So she went ahead and just slathered it on the tip of her nose and literally ate a hole through her nose. 
Yeah, I'm pretty well, sure the skincare's gonna probably ate the whole crew. No, no, yeah. really, I'm pretty sure that is. It's not a. It's, it's I mean, I can't even begin to tell you some of the stuff that I've seen with some of these skincare and stuff. And sometimes you, you know, that's why it's important that you do a self check and you and you look and you check everything, even under the arms. And if you have a beard, that you look through oh. it. And I have found so many things. Oh, wow hiding people's beards and mustaches and scalps and hair and you would be surprised even between the toes and with african-american or darker people you tend to see it in their nails or in their hand or on the back of their foot wow so every little thing that looks weird you should say hey what's this am i wrong i I actually did a small short period with a dermatology clinic when I was a staff nurse. Sure. And I was under the impression that melanomas or skin cancers that were distal to like the knee or elbow, those tend to be more highly aggressive. Is that true? They're all aggressive. They all can kill you. And the the irony is, you know, when you think about the spread to the lymph, if you really think about the path of melanoma. Okay, so here's the thing. So when you talk about basal cells, when you talk about basal cells, you know, little ones that look like little donuts and stuff, they're very slow growing. Um, but they cause a lot of tissue destruction, typically. But it takes sometimes years. Some people have it for years and say, oh, I had this, but I've never paid attention to it. And there's some, some aggressive ones, you know, some nodular ones that are aggressive. But melanoma doesn't spread out too much. It tends to spread down, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah. So it goes through those that first layer of the skin. And then it goes to that second layer. Then it goes to the third layer. Now we're down in these lymph cells and things like that. And that's how they get the staging of the actual melanoma versus anything else. And that's what makes it so deadly because now... It's actually in the cells. Now it's actually in the lymph nodes. Now it actually has, if it's in the lymph nodes, then it has the possibility to spread to other areas of the body and other things of the body. So hypothetically, let's say an African-American person just end up with this crazy lung cancer. Well, they don't know the cause or where it came from. Could it have been from something else that kind of spread? Could it have started with a skin cancer that spread? So it's those kind of things that... You need to look out for so any and there's different types of melanoma i mean another day but i mean there's so different so many different well put it this way there is one melanoma but there are different classifications of how it should look and those type of things and but the but the most important thing is to know that if you have it it should be removed i mean that's just any skin cancer should be removed where are the most common sites that you see skin cancer in your practice melanoma typically the back because that's the part that gets missed in primary okay people tend to lay the thesoscope on their chest and then they come to me as well oh like and you and it's usually incidental finding they look great everywhere else but then you look at their back and it's like oh what's this some of it has that classic characteristic of you know the ugly duckling sign if you've ever heard that well, put it this way. So say you deal with somebody who has a lot of moles. Okay, yeah, they may be more prone to skin cancers because they have a lot of moles. They're fair-skinned. They kind of meet the criteria, you know, with the whole list of what they should have. Here's the thing with melanoma, though. They don't like to bring a lot of friends. And so if you have a lot of moles, it's probably that one weird one that's just looking at you. And that's what we call the ugly duckling sign. It's just kind of hanging out like, hey, I'm over here. I know I don't belong. And it looks like it doesn't belong. And so those are the ones we typically biopsy and, you know, want to take off. As with basal cells, because they're sun-driven and you can get (laughs) many of them. Oh, it's not uncommon to have five or six basal cells hanging out in one spot or four or five of them on the face or five squamous cells in the scalp or, or, or eyebrow. It's not uncommon. But melanoma is very uncommon to have melanomas all over the plate, all over the body, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, no, that does. So from a family practice standpoint, I will occasionally remove lesions and send them off for pathology. Mm-hmm. Uh, first off, I don't like doing anything on the face because it's the face and I don't want to fuck it up. So I'm like, I would much rather send you to a dermatology person who does it all the time. 
but obviously with the deepness of melanoma, if there, if we even suspect that, that shouldn't be something in family practice that we're trying to take off. That should be just immediately referred to derm, right? No, not necessarily. Okay. So a lot of people are afraid of the face. So let me just say this to you. Most, <laughs> most melanomas are not on the face. Most of them are not on their face. They like to hide and they like to be in places that the sun is not necessarily at. That's why you can find them even with women in a uh, vaginal area. Oh, hair. So they hide. And for whatever reason that is, who knows? But they tend to hide. So, yeah, you can take them off. It just depends on how you're taking it off. Are you doing like a punch biopsy or are you doing a shave biopsy? If you suspect, let's say, melanoma, it's on the back, it's no major organs, no, no real structure there, just fatty tissue. I mean, you could go for it all day long. I mean, it wouldn't <laughs> cause the patient harm. Because <laughs> there's nothing there. There's there's nothing that could cause the person to actually, quote unquote, bleed out unless they're on a shitload of cuminin, but or, or whatever they're, right. or whatever they take. So if you feel like it's on the back and you know, you want to do a punch biopsy. The thing is with the punch biopsy, you just want to make sure that you actually get the margins. And even if you don't get the margins, it's okay. Typically, you're just trying to find out if this is benign or if this is something that needs to have some surgical intervention by most. That's what you're trying to do. Okay. On my instance, I'm trying to go beyond the margins because I'm trying to probably either excise it if I can if I can't excise it or if it's not safe enough for me to excise it, then I send it out. Typically, if I have to do an actual excision on the on the face, I will send it out. I have done them, but, you know, hey, person's 90. They don't give a care. They just want it out. It just depends on right. how cosmetically astute they want to be. But I can honestly tell you this. One of the surgeons who trained me said, you will never ever get sued for taking a biopsy that you thought was melanoma or you felt was skin cancer. I can see that. I yeah, guess. I mean, you know what I mean? So as far as you don't want to leave a scar, I mean, if you're talking about somebody who's, let's say, 30 years old who's getting married next week, I mean, and you're not an expert at it, then yeah, go ahead and send them, <laughs> send them on out. But Start hacking me. <laughs> somebody who doesn't care. Most men don't care. If they always give them the option of going and say, I can do this in office fairly safe, or I can send you to somebody else who could do it as well. So as a, I'm a newer nurse mm -hmm. practitioner, when I'm looking at something and I'm like, okay, I want to biopsy this. Is there some parameters, check parameters, guidelines or anything for when you do a shave versus a punch? Is there things I need to be looking for to make that decision before I send the specimen out? Yeah, you should. What? Let's think about it like this. I mean, I'm dermoscopy trained, so I can look under a specific type of light and kind of look for characteristics or patterns. Some things that you look at with the naked eye, they look out awful. I mean, they really do. You're yeah. like, this is weird. And then when you look under dermoscopy, you're like, oh, oh this is a cherry angioma. I mean, this looks great. <laughs> you're fine. So it depends on how you're looking at it. But let's say you look at it and it just looks like crap. Typical things that you want to try to, you can shave a basal. You can shave squamous cell. Always punch what you feel is a melanoma and always punch a rash. Because what you're trying to do with the melanoma, remember, I told you, it grows down. You're trying to give the pet, even if you don't get all of the margins, even if you leave some of it, you just need to know if it's okay. The goal is to get down to the core so you can get the depth of how deep is this melanoma. The pathologist lets me know if I can actually remove this in office or do I need a surgeon, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, no, that does. Yeah. So the pathologist will say... 0.25 millimeters. They'll give me a Clark scale. They'll tell me what this is. They'll tell me the type of melanoma. Re-excision is necessary or recommended. So that means that I didn't clear the margins. That means I need to go in. Or the pathologist will say, give me the same depths and say, margins clear. 
So that lets me know that, yeah, it was melanoma, but I got it all. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So from a pro- so from your standpoint, from a primary care standpoint, will it hurt you to biopsy? No, it won't. Here's the irony with primary care. Your your problem is location. Can you do it safely? Should you do it? Is always the primary care issue. Are you do you know how to do it? Do you know how to measure margins? Is this safe for this patient? Like I said, it's the back, fatty tissue, thigh, those kind of things. Yeah. Go for it. But you, if you're talking about his nasal bridge, brow, those kind of things, I mean, you kind of want to use caution on, can you do it? Of course you could do it. But the thing is, you kind of want to use caution on how you're going to do it and what are you actually looking for. So remember, melanoma, if you're concerned with the mole, you always want to punch, punch it out. And with a rash, you always want to punch it out. You never shave a rash because they can't get the depth of it. The pathologist can't get it. And everything else, you can just shave and send it. If it's a really, let's say, squamous or basal, you want to make sure you get enough tissue to send. So sometimes you got to do a little scoop shave. But again, you know, the benefit outweighs the risk, right? And so always offer the patient a surgeon. Always offer them a referral, I always offer them plastic because they'll ask you, will I get a scar? Yeah, you will, even if it's from me. <laughs> from pla- You're going to get one. It doesn't matter about who you want it from. And so you just have to make sure you're confident and that you know how to do this procedure. If you know how to do it, then you can reassure them that this is a procedure either I can do or I can send you to a derm person to do. Here's the irony with this, though. If it's on the face or if it's someplace you know that will require a mole surgeon. It's better to just let the mole surgeon biopsy it because typically they only have to go in once. In other words, if it's on the face and you're pretty sure it's something weird, there's no real point in biopsying it. It's just, it's just a matter of getting them to the person because how many times are you going to cut on the face? Right. Yeah. So if it's like the back, then okay, well, let's just check it out. They'll take a bigger, wider margin anyway when they actually take it out. So. Yeah, it's a whole different world. I mean, you know, but it, but it's good though. I mean, it's good if you if you know how to do it, then then you should do it. If you, it's good for the patient. You got to think about, and they want to know what it is most of the times. But you just oh, have yeah. to be no, cautious. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, I've been told with punch biopsy rashes, the recommendation was to not only get a portion of the rash, but also a portion of quote unquote normal skin, so that the Pathologists had the ability to kind of compare the two. If they have a rash, you get a punch in both in two places, and so because sometimes it's so weird. Like they'll have a rash on their back and a rash on their legs, and guess what? It'll be something totally different on their back and something totally different on their legs. So you always want to punch a rash in two places if you can. If it's only on one spot, um, typically what I'll do is try a course of treatment, and if I can identify it somewhat. I'll try a course of treatment, I'll wait a week or two and say, hey, if this is not any better, then we're going to do a biopsy and send this in and see what we're treating. Most of the times if they get better, then they get better. Then there's no point in doing that. But, right. but if they come and they look really jacked up and they're red and rashy all over, the first thing that comes to mind is a drug reaction. What medicines are you on? Like, what are you taking? And they'll say, oh, I'm taking my, my same stuff. <laughs> well... Does the dose change? So you have to look at those things too. And if and if it looks bad enough for you and you're worried about it and the patient is symptomatic with it, then go ahead and just take them. I mean, if you got to be doing prednisone and all that stuff, then you might as well just go ahead and just punch the rash and just send it in. So what are some things for us in primary care, what are some things that you'd like to either A, see that we've done or B, have notated or charted before we send the patient to you? Like, what are some things that we can do to better help our patients? And then if we need to send them to you, better help you with identification? Is or is there anything? Well, I think at the end of the day, um, I am primary. I just work during, we all, most of us are FMPs or that kind of thing. Uh, here's the thing though. Most of the things that I see can be managed in primary care. Most things. It's just a matter of does primary care know how to manage them. For instance, acne. I did a whole presentation 
on acne that you'll have to come to at some point. But most of those things can be managed in primary care. It's only when it's not controlled and they need to be an Accutane or something different than they come to me. Most primary cares, especially those who have their own office, I mean, they just they just throw money. <laughs> I mean, I'm not I'm not being physicians, but they just throw money at I'll say me for things that they really can manage. Now, when you start getting into biologics and autoimmune conditions and those kind of things, you know, that may fairly be a little bit out of your skill level or, you know, what you're trained for. And so I wouldn't be messing around with people with Stellar and Humera and all those kind of things in office and trying to treat skin cancer and stuff if that's not what you're geared to do. But if they come to you and they have a rash, surely you treat them. Right. Surely if you rule out, if you're not concerned with any autoimmune or lupus, I mean, surely you could test for lupus in the office. Surely you could. Then what's the recourse after that? Well, you can always send them to derm and send them to rheumatology. Can you treat acne? Sure. Why can't you? Most of us can write an acne prescription. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a matter of, do you know what to write? That's kind of what where people kind of get into this. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to send you to derm. So I think from a, from a primary care perspective, I think they're doing everything they know how to do. Most people who work primary care are very good at it. It's the never ending bowl. They know a lot of stuff. I mean, they know a lot of stuff in primary care and they see a lot of stuff. And so they do well. It's just a matter of knowing how to. And if you have your own practice, it behooves you to know how to because you don't want to from a financial, first of all, you want to provide good care for your patient. Right. Let's just put that out there. You want to do that. The second thing you want to do is you don't want to cause the patient to have unnecessary bills. Most of the things I treat, I send them right back to primary care. Most things I do, okay, we can fix this, but you know, this is, for instance, whatever kind of skin condition it may be, and this is a long-term skin condition that you have. If you have a alopecia well sure i can help you with your hair growth but at some point i mean it's only so many vitamin d3 i could give you you need to go back to primary care they need to be writing you understand it doesn't make sense for them to come to a derm office for me to be checking their vitamin d3 every you know five months, five months that should be in their panel and so those kind of things that i wish that i had the opportunity to work more closely with primary care to kind of guide them on that kind of stuff. Tom, do you got any other pressing questions? Well, I'll be honest. I got a feeling that we're probably going to need to do another derm related episode oh, yeah. in the future. And well, I just want to know if uh, Rochelle will just come back. On show. I like talking to her. Yeah. I just, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, there you go. That, that's my most <laughs> pressing thing. I just want to know. Well, so if, Tom, uh, before you go, I got a question. Yeah. Oh, are oh, you, are oh. you, are you, young man are you suturing your punch biopsies or are you leaving them open to, to heal okay well first of all i am in the walk-in clinic portion of okay. our family practice so i do not do a lot okay if it becomes something that normal rashes, they come in, if it's super itchy, you know, we might do a steroid or I might do steroid cream, et cetera. For the majority of the times that I have dealt with this, which has not been very often, I've done a very small punch and no, I have not done a suture. I do know mm. that the other nurse practitioners usually throw in like a stitch mm -hmm. if they have a bigger one. Okay. So FYI, you don't have to, it just, it leaks, but it'll heal nicer if you put a stitch in, but just in case you don't know how to stitch, you typically don't have to, but you would have to treat it as an open wound, if that makes sense. Well, so, you know, no rhyme or reason. Mm -hmm. Rochelle, I think that makes a nice segue into what I want to talk to you about before you leave. Okay. I, I believe that you have an online suturing course, correct? I do. Tom, you want to take a few minutes and tell us about that? <laughs> you know what? I just started it in May, and I mean, the reviews have been absolutely amazing. It's a four-hour suturing course that you can do online. It's a live suturing course, so basically I do a live two-hour lecture. I only usually allow about eight students in at one time, no more than that. 
It's very interactive, so you can ask your questions while we're going through the PowerPoint lecture. It's typical like this. They don't see me, but they see the presentation. I'm there, but I don't want to get distracted. You know, I don't want to distract students from, from my beautiful face. So I just kind of... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I knew where she was going. Yeah, you know where I was going. And so <laughs> they do that. And so we take breaks in between whenever. And it goes pretty quick. I can get through the lecture in probably about an hour and a half. But it's but it's a fun lecture. It's pretty interactive. You know, it has lots of pictures. It has lots of clinical pearls. It teaches you... Not only how the suture teaches you what type of suture to pick up, the size, what you should suture, what you should refer, those kind of things. And then from there, I have another computer that's set up for a different camera mode, and it actually walks them through four basic sutures, and I actually do two advanced sutures. I offer free support after the course, so up to 30 days you can get free support. I haven't had one person tell me that they needed to know how to do this again. And I've had people who have had suture courses who have taken this course. And I can't tell you the emails I get, the reviews have been, I mean, not checkmark, written out reviews have been very good from providers. I haven't, knock on wood, I haven't got a bad review. So a lot of people really enjoy this course. And so when it's done, the participants get a actual certificate that shows that they, you know, can accomplish all these skills and everything that comes from my dermatology practice, which is really nice because it's like legit, not Facebook, you know. <laughs> but for the most part, yeah, I, I like teaching it. It's fun. Um, I do a 7 to 11 course, a 12 to 4, and a 5 to 9. So people who work, so there's some people at night that can actually take it too. Offer it about four times a month. None in June, but definitely have it in July. And so definitely worth it, though, from what I'm hearing. Well, and I would say I saw some of the uh, information on that. I told Ben I don't do a lot of suturing. So I was like, I'm going to have to get this course <laughs> and uh, go through it myself. You would actually probably really like it, though. I'll give you a module, too. It's it's so simple. I, and, and, you know, and the way it was designed, and I made sure I designed it, so that, you know, when they taught us how to write when we were in school, they wanted to make sure that the lay person could pick it up. I actually designed it to where a person who was not in healthcare to our extent could actually somewhat pick this up and follow this. So it's really simple, but the information mm-hmm. is complex, if that makes sense. Like, it's so complex that it's simple. I can't explain to you, but you just have to take the course. In other words, it's not, okay, get this suture, okay, put it in here. It's not like that. Like, you get the real deal. I mean, you get the real literature information that's out there, but the, but it's broken down so simple that you're like, oh, okay, I get it. And then we do some case studies before we start the actual practice module. We do four case studies, and it's interactive, and we just talk and ask questions and they look at actual lacerations. We try to approximate the size, what type of suture we would use, what are we going to do when we see this, what are we looking for, those kind of things. So when you actually approach a laceration, you kind of know how to approach it or, you know, what should you be doing before you actually just go in there and jump in and just start doing stuff. So. Well, speaking of bad reviews, we, we, we haven't ever really got a bad no. review. I mean... We, we we did get a one star one time, I, yeah. But oh. that's the thing. I was like, why? I, I I that's your opinion. I'm cool with that. I just was like, could I know why? But they didn't tell us. Though we did end up making a shirt out of it. We got one that said "Most Okayest uh, <laughs> Podcast," and I was like, yeah, I like that one. That one yeah. ring. That one ring a bell. Like most okayest. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, God. You know, we can't satisfy the masses. We miss what it is. <laughs> Those who want it, want it. Those who true. don't, don't. Yeah. Well, is Listen there any mouth. other questions? Well, for me especially, Rochelle, but I mean for Ben or I? You can always contact me. No, you can always contact me off offline and stuff. I'm, you know, I'm pretty easily approachable. Just let me know what you need, how I can help you get there. But this has been really fun, and I'm glad that you guys invited me on. I had a good, good, good time. It was kind of one of those last-minute things for me because I was kind of in the middle of something, but it it worked out well. Well, we really do appreciate it. 
we we got what a couple more questions for you, but they, no. these aren't these aren't long questions. All right, go. All right, let me play the little music sound bite here first. Join us on a journey into the inner psyche of our guest as we ask five 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 five, 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 five. questions. <laughs> So these are just five little fun questions that we throw at all of our guests. All right. All right. Question. Should I be one. nervous? No, no, no. These these are fun. Oh, and just, oh, just yeah, answer them. Just, Don't think about it. Just, okay. just yep. give us your answer. Sure. Right. So no, question one, what is your favorite medical word? You're thinking too much. <laughs> I don't want to say the first thing that came to my mind. Oh, no. Come on, we got we, we got to do now. Yeah, yeah. What is it? What is it? Oh my god. <laughs> okay, impaction came to my mind first. <laughs> <laughs> impaction. <laughs> that came to my mind. I don't know why. Okay. Impact. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. No, no, that's that's a good favorite, one. But I'm just telling you, it came to my mind. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. All right. Question two. If you could do any job in the world other than what you're currently doing, what would it be? Oh, I'd definitely be a lawyer. Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> hmm. All right. So, so you, do you like arguing? Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> no, I don't like arguing, but I just want to get my point across. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I haven't found a, a fight I can walk away from. So okay, we can do I, this time. <sighs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, question three i want you to think back to your first car all right oh i got it all right was it a stylish ride or a rolling turd oh hell no it was a hoopty listen it was a great jetta <laughs> and people used to always look at me because it had a big hole on the door on the outside with one of those bars <laughs> Do you know how they make bar no seriously like dude, do you know how they make bars like for safety? Yeah. Well, it's a German it's uh-huh. a German made car, so all you could see was the bar. And people would pull up on the side of me and be looking at me. But the heat but the heat was good on that car. The heat was good. I was in Michigan. The heat was good on the car. Great. <laughs> all right. Uh, question four. If your house is on fire and everyone, including your pets, are safe. What's the one thing that you'd want to get out of your house? My passport. That shit's hard to renew. I'm telling you. <laughs> if you ever had to renew a passport, it's hard to renew. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I want my passport out of here. <laughs> that is a fair no, statement. No. Right All right, last question. Question yeah. five. Mm-hmm. You have $9.18 in your pocket. What mm-hmm. all do you buy? Nine dollars and eighteen cents. Well, I probably would buy some gum. Um, I probably I probably need a water. So what we're we talking now? We're down to two. Now we're down to seven dollars, aren't we? Hmm. Yeah, about, yeah. So we're now down to seven dollars. I probably would need to eat. So maybe I'll grab some chips. Well, chips are expensive now. Hell, they're like a dollar fifty nine. So they put me down for about five dollars and something like that. Um, chips, water, gum. Um, I think I'll hang on to the other five bucks. Well, there you go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> What's your chip? Choice? Well, you know the, Well, I mean, I'll be honest with you. There's going to be somebody. There's going to be somebody at the light with a sign. So I typically give them a buck or two. So yeah, I do. Yeah. Look at her, Look at her being being a good I person. Am. So. <laughs> I mean, it won't change my life, but it might change theirs. So two bucks. So I probably keep about three bucks. So yeah. Well, what's your chip choice? Well, what, I'm yeah, I'm with Ben. What I wonder what kind of chip. I was you got. thinking of some Doritos. Those sound good. Ooh. Oh, now we're talking like regular. Oh, they steal my heart. Yeah, like those oh, sound shit. really good. I'm trying to. I'm going on Ben. You're going on vacation soon, aren't you? Yeah, um, next week actually. Yeah. Where are you going? Uh, we're going down to the Caribbean. We're doing a cruise. We're going to. Uh, Mahogany Bay, Cozumel, and Belize. Wow. Okay. So I'll be in Jamaica in two weeks. So, okay. Nice. You been there? I've not been there, no. Tom, have you? Okay. No. That's one of the few foreign countries. Okay. I so y'all been missing to. out. I'm telling you. I'm going to shoot you some. No, <laughs> seriously. Like, everybody goes over there. People from everywhere, Switzerland, everywhere. That's one place you got to put on your bucket list. So. All right. 
Well, I would love to go. I would like to go anywhere at this point. I haven't had a vacation in a couple of years. So at this point, we, we are trying to plan a, a Disney cruise for the end of the year. But uh, my wife, when I keep saying, hey, we really need to you know, put a budget together, pay some stuff off so we can put money back for this. Apparently, I speak in French or Portuguese when I talk to my wife about budgets because she ain't done shit to make that happen. <laughs> oh, by the way, further update. She's further update. And Rochelle, so you, I, I'm glad you're on because, you know, you're married. So I heard you say your husband earlier. So my wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah has not caught on to the fact that I know she doesn't listen to my fucking show <laughs> because I, and this should have been, the, I actually pretty much gave it away, Rochelle. What's I her, pretty much, cause I looked, I looked right at her. What's her name? Her, her name, Megan. Okay. I'm not about to sit here and let you talk shit about Megan. And no, Megan no, 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 no. Listen, no, listen. It's shut it down. No. <laughs> no, no, it's funny. It's funny because she keeps telling me she listens to the show. Right. And I'm like, really? You, you listen to the show, and that's what I'm saying. I gave it away. I looked her dead in the eye. I was like, R- really? You listen to the show? She's like, yeah. I was like, you sure you listen to the show? Yeah, because for multiple weeks now, I've been saying my wife doesn't listen to the show, and all she has to do is say something to me about that segment, and I'll 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 know she listened to the show. She clearly is not listening to the show because is she the point. She listens to Ben. She doesn't want to hear you. She doesn't want to hear you. I don't want you talking about Megan and Megan's not here within the show. Now, if Megan come on the show, no, no, I'm serious, Tom. No, I'm serious. If, if Megan decides to come on the show and can defend herself, then that's fine. But if she's not listening, it's not fair for you to go there with Megan. Boom. No, told you. Don't be talking about the budget. No, no, mm-mm, I'm not doing it. I, no, man. Let me call Megan. Oh, <laughs> oh damn! I, I, I would absolutely. I will absolutely. When, when we were off the air, I will absolutely be like, "You want her number? Here it is." I swear to. God. And we've had we've had Megan on the show, so I'm just oh, saying you know. that's that's. So that's that's what kills me is like, but she should have known something was up. But I'm like, really? You, you do? Is, is she a provider or a practitioner? Of nerves? Is she? She's a respiratory therapist. Okay, she's not interested in what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> she's a You need to put uh, something good on. You need to put like some intubation stuff on. You know, Ben or at your corner and do some corner work. Yeah. You do something like that. Make it look, yeah, make it come on. And listen to that. She's not interested in this. Okay, and I don't so, want to come on with Megan. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I will let her know. Special special edition Rochelle oh, here. I'm going to talk, so. talk to her before we, uh, <laughs> Tom, before we look up our love. Tom, your ass is in trouble, buddy. I'm telling you what. Mm, I feel confident. All right, fellas. You confident. know I got a long day tomorrow. It's new, I'm, <laughs> in, I'm on New Mexico time, so I know it's late there. It has to be like 12 o'clock there, 1 o'clock there. Yeah, yeah, for it's me. About midnight. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm working in the morning. Yeah, yeah. Let's wrap this up. Uh, is there anything else, Rochelle, that you want to say to everybody? No, but thank you. No, everybody no. was, everybody was cool. I love it. You know what? I want to go back and listen to it. I want other people to listen to it. I told a couple of friends about you guys. I'm like, you gotta come on, do your thing. You know, awesome. And kind of go from there. So. I'm really excited for you guys, and I'm really proud of the work you're doing. I mean, it's fun, and well, it's all games, but, you know, at the end of the day, I think you're kind of touching on some very important stuff that, as providers, we we need to hear, and it's, and it's a good outlet. It's, it's really a good outlet, and it, it helps keep us all sane and together and working, you know, like we should together as providers, and I really enjoyed that part of it, so I, I respect that from you guys. So. Well, thank you very much, ma'am. No, we, yes. we really do appreciate that. So, anyway, we're going to wrap this show up. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or at Just Some Podcast. You can find us on the web, www.justsomepodcast.com. Emails, admin at justsomepodcast.com. If you're interested in Rochelle's online suturing course, we will drop that information down in the show notes below. So, like she said, no courses in June, but there's going to be some opening up in July. So, if that's something that you're interested in, Get hold of her and let her know about that. Anyway, beyond that, Tom, we're going to be doing a quick back. We're going to record again in a couple of days with next week's episode because I'm going to be on the cruise, and so we got to get everything out and ready to uh, get released so that I'm not going to have any internet access. So, I mean, I could, but I'm not going to pay like $75 a day for it. Um, <laughs> uh, no. 
you you got shit to do. You're on a cruise. Yeah. And it's about it. drinking. <laughs> it relaxes. <laughs> So, but yeah, we're going to do that for next week. And then I think the week after that is Father's Day. And that time alluded to earlier, we're going to do a special episode for Father's Day. And over nice. there. but otherwise, again, Rochelle, thank you so much for being here. We greatly appreciate it. And I do. Yeah, time. <laughs> See y'all. Thank you. Appreciate you. All right. I hope everybody uh, has a great week. Uh, this is Tom. Everybody stay safe. Shut up.